Good evening. Welcome to Evening Prayer for Friday, November the 27th. Today is the beginning of the time of Christmas. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold, the Lord comes to save us. O come, let us worship him. Let my prayer rise before you as incense. The lifting up of my hands is the evening sacrifice. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Come and hear all you who fear, uh, all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Our New Testament reading tonight is from Peter's first letter, beginning in chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Blithnia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it be tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who have preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. And our first reading with Luther tonight is from Galatians 2.21. I don't reject God's kindness. If we receive God's approval by obeying laws, then Christ's death was pointless. Shoving aside God's kindness. Wanting to receive God's approval by our own works through the law is so wrong that the Apostle Paul calls this throwing God's kindness away. It shows not only ingratitude, which is extremely bad in itself, but also shows contempt because we should eagerly seek God's kindness. Instead, we shove aside his kindness, which we receive free of charge. This is a serious error. Consider Paul's argument. If we receive God's approval by obeying laws, then Christ's death was pointless. Paul confidently declares that either Christ's death was pointless, which is the highest blasphemy against God, or Christ's death was essential, and through the law we can have nothing but sin. Some teachers categorize various kinds of righteousness using distinctions that they have made up in their heads. If these teachers try to bring these ideas to theology, they should be kept far away from the Holy Scriptures. For these people say one kind is a moral righteousness, another is a righteousness of faith, and they describe others I don't even know about. 
Let civil government have its kind of righteousness, the philosophers have theirs, and each person have his own. But we must understand righteousness the way the Bible explains it. The Apostle clearly says that there is no other righteousness than through faith in Jesus Christ. All other works, even those according to the most holy laws of God, do not offer righteousness. Not only that, they are actually sins. Our sins are so great and so far away from righteousness that it was necessary for the Son of God to die so that righteousness could be given to us. When discussing theology, don't call anything righteousness that is apart from faith in Christ. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, we thank you that you have redeemed us poor and condemned creatures, not by any of our works, merit, or worthiness, but by your holy suffering, death, and shedding of blood. O Lord, your suffering was great, your torment was heavy. We cannot comprehend how many your stripes, how deep your wounds, or the bitterness and painfulness of your death. How inexpressible is your love that reconciled us to your heavenly Father. In great fear of death, you sweat blood on the Mount of Olives, drops of blood that fell upon the earth. And there, abandoned by all your disciples, you willingly gave yourself into the hands of those who led you mercilessly, bound hard and cruel from one unjust judge to another. You were falsely accused and condemned, spit upon, scoffed at, and struck in the face with fists. For the sake of our misdeeds, you were hit, whipped, crowned with thorns, and treated wretchedly, like a worm and not a man. You were despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, so that even the heathen heart took pity and said, Behold the man. For the sake of our sin, you were counted a sinner and hung up between two evildoers as a curse. You were pierced in hands and feet with nails, and in your highest thirst you were given vinegar and gall to drink. Finally, in great pain, you gave up your spirit, so that you could pay our debt and we could be healed by your wounds. O Lord Jesus Christ, for this and all your other suffering and pain, we give you thanks and praise. We pray you, let your holy bitter suffering and death not be lost on us. But grant that at all times this may be our comfort, and that we may boast in it, and that as we ponder it, all evil desire in us may be snuffed out and subdued, and all virtue may be implanted and increased, so that we, having died to sin, may live in righteousness, following the example you have left us, walking in your footsteps, enduring evil with patience, and suffering injustice with a good conscience. Amen. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our shorter reading with Luther tonight is based on Psalm 118.17. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord, the God of the living. Whenever in the Psalter and Holy Scripture the saints deal with God concerning comfort and help in their need, eternal life and the resurrection of the dead are involved. All such texts belong to the doctrine of the resurrection and eternal life, in fact to the whole third article of the Creed, with the doctrines of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection, and everlasting life. And it all flows out of the first commandment where God says, I am your God, Exodus 20, verse 2. This third article of the Creed emphasizes insistently 
While Christians deplore the fact that they suffer and die in this life, they comfort themselves with another life than this, namely that of God himself, who is above and beyond this life. It is not possible that they should totally die and not live again in eternity. For one thing, the God on whom they rely and in whom they find their consolation cannot die, and thus they must live in him. Besides, as Christ says, he is a God of the living, not of the dead, and of those who are no more. Matthew 22, 32. Therefore, Christians must live forever. Otherwise, he would not be their God, nor could they depend on him unless they live. For this little group, therefore, death remains no more than a sleep. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul in all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.